where we share the super cool backstories and side gigs of the research and insights pros that you trust. Now, today is a very special episode. This is the open mic format where I am rejoined by my guest from episode number 34, Priscilla McKinney. Welcome back, Priscilla. I love being on a podcast. And if you have been listening to Matt and enjoy all the stuff he gives you, please go out and give him a nice review right now. This is a lot of hard work to put a podcast together. Do the guy a favor and bring someone else to the party. So thanks, Matt, for having me on. All right. Disclaimer, I didn't ask you to say that, but I thank you for saying it. <laughs> <laughs> so so many of you, probably most of you who listen to this podcast know that Priscilla is the CEO of Little Bird Marketing. And in the previous episode, we explored a little bit about her story growing up as part of a family singing troupe. So if you want to hear about that topic, you can go back to episode number 34, but we're not going to be talking about that today. Instead, we're going to be talking about Priscilla's really fantastic book called Collaboration is the New Competition, which I have greatly enjoyed reading um, and found it extremely useful. So... Uh, Hey, I want to talk about it if that's okay. <laughs> I love it. I love I love hearing that people are reading it, but more than that, Matt, I, I love that people are applying pieces of it or that it yeah. shifted a perspective about something and and got them maybe unstuck. That's what I was really going for. Yeah, yeah. There were there were some elements in here where I thought, you know what, I've I've come by this lesson kind of naturally and and I'm doing that and I feel good about it. But then there's a whole lot more that's like oh yeah, I need to be really intentional about that. So I uh, found it really useful. So a couple of things I want to say first and foremost is uh, kind of embedded in the title. It It is a counterintuitive book, right? Collaboration is the new competition. Of course, we think of competition as the evil enemy and we don't work with them, um, but uh, this is a little counterintuitive and she makes the case really, really well. So that's really cool. Um, I also found it to be a really optimistic book, one where it's like, yes, I can do that, peppered with examples of uh, actually people using the framework or the concepts um, that I know and I can, you know, think of personally. I'm like, oh, okay, I can see that work. So that's that's really cool. And of course, it gives a really good roadmap on how uh, anybody can apply these concepts and turn collaboration into a, a, a tool of success for them. So super cool. All I right. love it. And I don't, I didn't try and make any, you know, uh, statements that somebody couldn't just immediately understand. I did not try and be yeah. lofty. I just, you know, it's kind of like the books that I really appreciate are the people who put things into a word and I go, I've kind of already known that. I just, I didn't really know, know it. And now not only do I have a word for it or a phrase for it that will help me to kind of come back to this knowledge that I probably had somehow, but now it helps me use it. And then also it helps me communicate it to someone. Oh, when that happens, that's actually this happening. And it gave, I hope people a vocabulary to discuss how we can do the things better. But Matt, I loved you saying that it's a very optimistic book because it is. And I'm telling you, if you have a scarcity mentality, you're going to hate my book. Don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, couple, one last thing I want to say about it is um, you mentioned the language you use throughout the book, and I really appreciate that it is extremely efficient, right? It is not, wor it's not wordy. Um, it's really straight and to the point. It's really clean, simple language, uh, very easy to, uh, to digest the concepts. So uh, really cool stuff. So with that, uh, Priscilla, Let's get to the first question. You know, I'm sure it's always the first question, but tell me about the inspiration to, to write this book. You know, why, why'd you put this down on paper? Well, you um, and I talk uh, uh, pretty frequently. We're quite good friends, full disclosure. <laughs> um, and we've become good friends through just being colleagues. And I find that that's a very optimistic um, way of connecting with people, right? This is why we why we get along. But you um, brought up in a different conversation we were just having about um, mutual connection we have through the company called Fieldwork. And they are a very collaborative and uh, hospitality-driven focus group facility and recruiting uh, company. So, you know, shout out to 
to them, whatever. But <laughs> my point here is that we are, you know, connected together because we all kind of approach business the same way. And I remember Sarah Kotva from Fieldwork even saying to me one time, my gosh, you came onto the insights um, industry scene and went from zero to 60, like overnight, like you were a nobody. And then, you, you know, you were connected to everybody and an influencer. And she was kind of scratching her head and just like, how did you do that? She's like, I've been in this industry forever. And, <laughs> you know, it was comments like that over many years that really pushed me to say, you know, this thing that I do naturally that seems pretty obvious to me is not obvious to other people. And I think that is true. That's not, you know, puffing me up. There are things that are very natural and obvious to other people that they fail to share with other people because it seems so duh to them. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I had a lot of experiences like that with really trusted colleagues who said, but how did you do that? And I thought, oh, well, do I really just need to write it down? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. These are different, you know, anchors that keep me, you know, heading toward a particular direction or, you know, help me really get my wits about me in order to really make my time in business more efficient. And so I just thought, you know what, at this point, I really do just need to share them. Yeah, yeah. And the, the book when it came out was no surprise to me because I have heard you use that term before. So I could tell that, you know, it's kind of like that, that story about Abraham Lincoln wrote his speeches in his head like he didn't have to write them down. He just worked them over his head, worked them over just for months at a time. And then then it just came out because he already knew it. Uh, well, you know, like you, that. you know that from being a podcast host, you, you do have, um, a particular expertise that you really come and fall back on and you test those ideas with a lot of people. So having a podcast and being a podcast host is actually a really great way to be writing those speeches in your head. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Cool. Um, so the first part is that the book is like organized in, in two different parts. Uh, the first part is really about what is collaboration and and even more importantly, what is it not, right? <laughs> um, and this I found to be super eye-opening. And uh, the first lesson I really took from it was that collaboration needs to, to be with a conscious intention and a plan. So can you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah. Yeah. So I talk about it in the book a little bit with my, um, with my acknowledgement of the kumbaya effect, yes. right? <laughs> because there are some people who are thinking collaboration. They're in the back, like twitching right now. Just, there's no yeah. way, no way in hell I'm collaborating with anybody. Like I've had those experiences, <laughs> you know, we've all been voluntold onto committees or, you know, been asked to do particular work with particular people, but really for no apparent reason, just for the sake of collaborating. And so some of us are very, um, have an aversion to it. And what I would say, and what I do say in the book is that it, you don't have an aversion to collaboration. You weren't doing collaboration. So let's get specific. Collaboration requires these three things. Number one, everybody involved has to have something to lose and something to gain. Right. Let that sink in for a bit. But the second one is people that you're involved with. They have to be willing to show cards right? They have to be able to tell you why they're there, what they need out of it. I'm not talking about sharing trade secrets. I'm talking about being honest about what they are going to lose and what they are going to win. Right. And then the last piece is that they have to have a desire to win period for mm -hmm. themselves, for you, for the organization, for the goals of the, of the collaboration, whatever it is, they have to be someone who has verb and life and tenacity or something. So you can't just keep pairing yourself with people who kind of meh, call it in. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit? Cause I loved the notion of everybody having to have something to win and something to lose. Um, Cause you know, you should think about collaborations. Oh, I want to work with this person. You know, they're really cool. And you don't really think about those things. Can you talk about why that's important? Yeah. The example that everybody resonates with is I took right from my fifth grader. <laughs> right? <laughs> so God bless him. He came home from school and he's got a collaboration he needs to do. So um, it's a science project. We're all like already just dying inside, right? Because they pair the A student with the C student and the F student, and now they're going to collaborate. And this is what they think will actually bring about some kind of a win. But the A student has nothing to win and they have everything to lose. 
the C student it is right in the middle. Like, eh, that right. they don't have really anything to win. They don't really have anything to lose. And the F student only has something to win, nothing to lose. So th th those are the three sides of it. And you can see it in something very practical in your life. But now if you take that and you feel, you feel the angst you're already feeling of, first of all, I mentioned fifth grade, everybody's going to be feeling some angst, <laughs> right? But if you take that and you're like, but I feel that same feeling when I get in this committee at work, you know, yeah. and I got assigned to this and you know, I, I either, you know, you're on one of those three things. You have something to win or lose or whatever, but I really believe it only works when everybody has both. Yeah, totally. That makes so much sense. Um, and it, it kind of introduces the confusion between group work and actual collaboration. And let me ask something about that because, um, you talk about how important it is to be selective about who you're collaborating with. What can you do if you're in that situation where you are appointed, right? And you don't really have a choice of who, what, what can you do in that situation? Well, yeah, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, I, obviously I, in the book, and as you mentioned, the second part has anchors where you can do course corrections. So right, those are some right. anchors that could help you. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but I do think the very beginning, you can introduce the idea and ask people those three questions, kind of use that framework and maybe don't come in, you know, guns a blazing and be like, I'm not going to work with you if you don't master these three things, <laughs> but maybe we inquire and ask people, you know, do you have something to lose? And do you have something to win? Like, why are you here? And, and just helping people give them a space to be honest about it, you know, and say, well, you know, I've been asked to be on this committee and what I stand to gain is that I could get some personal branding or I could get some, you know, uh, gravitas, some, 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 you know, points from my boss, but what I could lose is I'm not going to get my work done. Okay. That's fine. That's enough. So that people are awake and alive to what they're doing there. I think that's good. So when you walk in that room, you think about that. The other thing I would say that I talk a little bit about in the book is about the hierarchy that you need to be careful of when you're walking in a room like that. And I'm very mindful of it as the CEO, right. the moment I walk in the room, I get all the airspace. Yeah. It changes the dynamic entirely. Yeah. Yeah. And so intentionally you've got to undo that hierarchy um, for yeah. the sake of collaboration um, and really understand what is it that everybody has to contribute here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so related to that, you talk about the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule. Can you talk about what the platinum rule means in this? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Now, I grew up the the kid of missionaries, so I'm very well acquainted with the golden rule, and I think everybody else is. So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But the platinum rule, in my opinion, is a much better rule. It's a step above, and it's do unto others as they want done to them. So it's right. kind of like, you know, um, somebody buying somebody, you know, um, a gift that just is more for them than it is for the other person. And we've all had, you can fill in the blank of the experience that you've had with this, you know, and uh, it, it's about really walking into a room and assessing it and being willing to understand that the way you like to operate is not the way everybody else likes to operate. And I'm not saying it has to be an equality thing. I think it needs to be acknowledged. And so there mm. are some times when you need to operate outside of your natural system and you need to give to people what it is they need, not what you would have done to yourself. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. Uh, and that, that kind of leads into the whole notion of passive versus active collaboration. So uh, tell us a little bit about that concept. Well, I see it a lot online, first of all, and I think it's easier to see that there. And then once you learn that, then you can kind of translate it and see it in other places of work and other places of personal life. But sure. a lot of people think they're participating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, as you know, I teach courses on social influence um, for the B2B professional. And so often people come to me and say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. I'm like, mm, that's interesting because I never see you. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> I would have seen you if you were it's out the there. It's algorithms, man. It's the algorithms. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But what I see is a lot of people spend time doing a thing, but very little time really engaging in a thing properly. And so it's very passive. And, you know, you kind of look at right. it, it's a voyeur. And there are a lot of people who are like that out online. 
But mm. I like to remind people, but there are a lot of people like that you know, in person also, um, mm -hmm. they're there, but they're not there. They're going to show up. They're actually sometimes the most punctual people to these committees or these groups or this collaboration, but right. they're not really there. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to really be mindful of, you know, as you make work assignments or as you ask for the collaboration around the table, what are the kinds of ways you can, you can um, structure your meeting, your conversation, your event, whatever it is, in order to really get more active participation in it. You know, I understand that maybe that day you're talking about a topic that really is in one person's expertise, but yeah. unfortunately that person has one way of thinking in that expertise and collaboration might bring a really helpful, different perspective if you are mindful of it. And so we need to really engage with more active uh, participation and less passive. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. All right. So when I think of collaboration, like the scariest part is, you know, a lot of this applies to, uh, you know, kind of building your personal brand or building out yep. your network, uh, you know, work meetings, those kinds of things with partners and, and colleagues and that sort of thing. But it's a different thing to think about collaborating with competitors. And I think that's where people start to get kind of wrinkled because you're so used to uh, you know, being at loggerheads and, you know, trying to win and beat the, beat the competition and um, talk a little bit about uh, collaboration with the competitor, what that looks like or what it even means. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, you do have to have uh, just a mindset of abundance, number one. Um, right. And then secondly, you need to be careful. You need to find people you can trust. This is not for sure. every competitor, Right. Yes. So, and also legally protect yourself, get your NDAs in place, get everything else. I mean, listen, business is business, but when you have found those people that you have tremendous rapport with, you have built trust. I have to say you almost can't collaborate and succeed anymore in this particular business world. And I, I, I really, I, I'll die on that hill. Once upon a time, you could start a company, bootstrap it and, you know, bring it to life but it is so much harder. The digital noise that is out there to bring a business to life is ridiculous. And what you need to do is find ways, small and big, to leverage other people's success and work together. And one small way, just for example, just so that people don't are like, well, what does she mean by that? For example, me being on your podcast is a collaboration. Yeah. I'm being honest. I, you know what I have uh, to gain out of this? I get your audience, right? What I have to lose out of this is that then people are going to, my brand is going to bring people to your podcast. Great. I have sure. something to win, something to lose, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going to show my cards. I'm going to, Matt, hey, if you have me on, I'll do this. Hey, show my, but I mean, we happen to be friends, so it wasn't that hard of a talk. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> right. But what am I going to do? I showed up. The first thing I said in this podcast was thank you for having me on and make sure you go rate and review, you know, Matt's podcast. This idea of, you know, you need to be in it. Um, you know, showing your cards and saying, Hey, this is what I'm going to get out of it. But guess what? I have a desire to win too. I have a desire to win for me and for you. And so we're collaborating in a small minute. Now this is only going to last a half an hour of collaboration. Maybe you look at it a couple weeks online, right? Mm -hmm. So collaborations don't have to be massive and year yeah. upon year, they can right. be in small little places. And another place that we do this, a lot of times I bring companies together and have private uh, events and really high-end beautiful dinners to bring people together before a conference starts. This is another way that you can have a small little connection, but I am leveraging your success right now, Matt, for my gain. And so this collaboration, so even selfish. Though, Come on. I know, <laughs> but you got to get good with that. Yes. You have course, to be selfish. Yeah. I am selling something and I yeah. don't want to hide that. And I'm not embarrassed and I'm not ashamed about that. Right. And I'm going out with my message and I'm asking you to do that. And in exchange, these are the things I'm going to give. I'm going to push people to your show. I'm going to talk about how generous you are. I'm going to, so you find these people that will also bring something to the table. Yeah. Yeah. And you share another example in the book about this that I really love that a lot of our listeners uh, would be familiar with, which you mentioned field work earlier on. Uh, during the pandemic, obviously, you know, in-person focus groups just got crushed. 
Uh, but as a means to to keep it going, uh, field work, I think Sarah Katha, who you also yes. mentioned, episode number 41, by the way. Um, <laughs> <I love> it. <laughs> she, it's all coming together, the whole collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So she introduced the hashtag face-to-face -face MRX, which has been tremendously successful. Rising tide lifts all boats, right? It's not, they weren't, they weren't selling field work. They were selling the notion of how important it is to get out in front of your customers. And uh, it was a good thing for, for, for all, I suppose, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it came, she had to sacrifice for it. I mean, this was a time when you're right. Things were very difficult for face-to-face, -face, but yeah. there are really key things that had to keep going. Healthcare, trials. I mean, there's, you know, there's so yeah. many things that, that needed to keep going in it. There was a value to being in person. So you needed the experts, but yeah, it was going to all of her competitors and saying, let's all pool money. And they hired me as a firm to create a campaign to have a groundswell and a, a real, um, a, a, a new education and an appreciation for what face-to-face -face market research does. And I thought it was so smart and I was so behind it, loved it. The way she led that initiative was very smart. And yes, it did help a lot of other businesses. Yes, it helped them. But the, 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 the beautiful, you know, way that she was able to come and involve anybody. And I, you know, maybe this is talking a little bit out of school, but in the consortium of everybody who collabed, not everybody could afford to put into the pot and they did not exclude people. Right. And right. I thought that was such a tremendous testament to the leadership in that group. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. It was such a tremendously difficult time for those firms and, and lo and behold, now they're alive and thriving and, and, uh, you know, it's just like old times. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And she's wanting them to continue and really see this as a way forward and not just do yeah. this in a hard time. And so, you know, yeah, I give her a shout out for wonderful leadership there. Um, that same amount of generosity. Um, and I love that it is rising tides lifts all boats and it's this win, win, win. It's not, a, a, a this, um, binary, if I win, you lose scenario anymore. And I just want to walk away from that. I don't want to live in a business world where that's how it has to work. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Now I, I, as you know, I, I describe this book as an optimistic book. And I think a big part of that is, is the whole distinction between a scarcity mindset uh, versus a mindset of abundance, which you, you referenced here. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Cause it's such an important concept in the book. Yeah, you know, a lot of people don't have the patience for um, really thinking about this abundance mindset, you know, and I understand, listen, I, I'm a dyed in the wool salesperson, and we help teams um, grow for revenue. I mean, if you want to talk about predictable revenue, then you should talk with me as the CEO of Little Bird Marketing. Okay, I love that drive for revenue, I, sales. I, I love all of them <laughs> and mm -hmm. I am constantly having them get call to actions in there. Let's move towards revenue. I don't believe in marketing for the sake of marketing, right? That's all great. That's the sale moment. It's not that we're not driving there, but you cannot start there. You have to lead with giving. You have to build rapport. You have to provide content that is overtly helpful. And I would say it, that is not only interesting, but shows that you are interested in your audience. Right, and right. I liken it to this idea of, you know, if you ask me to go on stage right now, since we're talking on rock and roll research podcast, uh, let's talk about some music. I do play guitar. And when I get up and play guitar, I always tune it first. Yeah. And that is just showing some love for your audience. Thank right? you for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants to listen to that crap, but that's a lot of times how we go out guns a blazing out on LinkedIn or out in an event or accosting somebody at, you know, a trade show. And this idea of this, I've got to get, no, you need to give first and it will come back. And this reciprocity idea is really strong in the book. And I think that is what breeds long-term success and big, 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 big wins. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so the first part of the book, as I mentioned, I mean, it sort of introduces that notion, like this is the mindset, mindset of abundance, right? It, it describes what collaboration is and isn't, and then makes the case for why it can be really good for you, how you need to be intentional to cultivate it, et cetera. So kind of the nuts and bolts. Uh, and the second part just is filled with all of this gold, right? So it's, it's these principles that uh, that you can adopt to make sure that you're following through on um, 
this whole mindset of collaboration and you call it casting anchors. You've got seven different anchors, but give us a kind of an overview of what that concept is. Yeah. So I do love to sail. My husband and I are sailors. And so I couldn't help, you know, <laughs> put it this way, but this is also how I think these are things that I move very fast. I'm a quick start. I'm a nine on the Colby scale. If any of you ever done that. Um, so I think of something and we're already doing it. Right. So I move pretty fast toward a destination and sometimes it's not working out a storm hits. Right. And that is reality. It's, it's not going according to plan. And so there aren't these prescriptive things, you, you know, it works like this, it works like this collaboration is very expansive. So it could be very, a lot of different things, which means that the problem could be a lot of different causes. And so I created these seven anchors just at, maybe there's eight, maybe there's not, I don't know. I came up with seven and I think they're helpful to say, Hey, when a storm hits sailing, it's best mm -hmm. to cast an anchor. It's best to put one down get, get, you know, safe and think of a new way forward and figure out what went wrong here. Right. So this yeah. idea of like finding, finding something that will hold you. And I talk in the book about how a lot of people don't know this, but with different boats, but there are different anchors on board. One is for right. a rocky bottom. One is for sand. One is for except on and on and on. You have to have the right one. If you try and put, you know, a, a, a kind of a anchor for, you know, for sand, in where there's mud, you're going to drag, you're going to, it's not going to work. Right. Sure. Um, and so a lot of people aren't aware of that. And so what I'm saying is that sometimes when something goes wrong, it's not the same and you can't fix it always the same way. Yep. So you have to cast a few different anchors and try, could this be the problem? Could this be the problem? <laughs> yeah. And, and so I give people seven things to choose from to say, you know, maybe this was the problem at the beginning. Maybe I didn't do this piece of it right. And that's why the collaboration is going wrong. So if the anchor holds you there, helps you set a new course, discover what went wrong and then move on. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I have a couple of questions about a couple of these anchors that you call it in the book. I just love that they have these memorable, uh, these memorable monikers that are easy, easy to, to hang on to. So the first is about always be helping as opposed to always be closing. It's not about altruism, uh, but helping them to help you, right? Right. Um, the second one just has such a great title. I wanna, I wanna have you uh, talk a little bit about the concept. It's called Itchy Backs. So tell us about what Icky, Itchy Backs is all about. Okay, it's almost so creepy to say. It just makes you think of somebody you work with scratching your back. Like that's just not, it's awful. No but I couldn't think of another way. And actually it is so memorable, but I think it's actually the most powerful anchor yeah. really in the book. And I really love talking about it. And I realized it's really the basis of what I'm doing when I'm networking. I am listening for problems. Like where is someone going, oh, I can't quite, reach it, get that for me. So where do people have itchy backs that they just can't scratch for themselves? That's what you're collecting, not necessarily people who I'm going to do business with, right? Yeah. So it means that you have to be a very good question um, asker, and it means you have to be a very good listener. Right. And I do put an interesting example in the book, but not, not to go into that one, but it's about like saying, okay, what is your problem that you're facing? What is your problem that you're facing? When you really change your mindset and you want to start collaborating and you want to have bigger wins, you realize you need a bigger room with people who have all kinds of what seem to be disparate problems. Mm -hmm. But maybe if you all get in the room together, you can solve it for each other. And I liken this to what they call kind of a domino transplant. I didn't talk about it this way. I don't think in the book, but okay. when I speak, I talk about it a lot, you know, like, okay, so let's say my husband needs a kidney, but I'm not a kidney match for him, but I'm a kidney match for your kid and your kids a match for this person and this person right. match, and we can create this circle. Right. And right. so they create these massive circles of donor of transplants and they're very successful, but they are, they, they, they take a lot of attention to detail and they take a lot of bringing people in together who have something to lose and something to gain. Right. right. And yeah. they are willing to show their cards and they are, they have a, a desire to win. I mean, they want this kidney for their loved one, right? It's yeah. perfect collaboration really. And so you want to find people who have all these different problems. And eventually what you do 
is you can put people in the room and go, well, I can't give you what you want, but this person can, and that person's going to give this person what they want. And this person's going to give them what they want. And then that person's going to give me what they want. And you start like layering people in a really sometimes complicated way, but it gets mm -hmm. easier and easier the more you do it because you realize you can't solve that exact problem. But I guarantee you putting people together like that ingratiates them to you and Perfect. they look for another way to help you. It, it nice. totally works. And that's the itchy backs is like you start not just listening to people and networking as like, oh, well, what are you trying to achieve? No, what, what is driving you crazy? What can you not yeah. get done for yourself? What do you really need help with? What is keeping you up on Sunday night? Mm -hmm. right? And you start having better conversations and then those become meaningful collaborations. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I love that. Um, so just moving forward, I know you've got this, you've got this uh, anchor around digital first. That one, uh, I say, go read it. It's the meatiest part of the book, I think. Um, there's so much gold in there. Uh, things that you can apply that you're just like, God, why haven't I been doing this? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's right there. Um, so good stuff um, and vice versa as well. You talk about this um, this notion of connecting with people in multiple locations. And those locations can be offline or online, you know, digital or real life. Can you talk about why that's important? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, I kind of usually ask people, you know, are they dying the wool Lyft people or Uber people? Right. So which is it for you, Matt? Uh, I'm Uber all the way. Okay. So Uber all is for Matt here. <laughs> and so the question I would ask you then is when was the last time you got in an Uber and you told the driver, oh, just take me anywhere you want to go? Uh, that would be never, <laughs> never. Right. But that's what we do with, um, channel preferences. So you're like, well, I'm out on LinkedIn, so I'm going to meet only everybody on LinkedIn. Right. Or I go to XYZ conference. Nice. I don't ever go to something else. This idea is like, we take our own personal preferences and then let it just take us in, uh, you know, to a destination, maybe that's not the right destination. And so, yeah. you know, the, the vice versa and the Uber versus Lyft, these kinds of concepts are really there to help you understand, wait, am I like actually, you know, dooming my end based on this small little preference I'm choosing at yeah. the beginning <laughs> or it, can I be expansive? And so if I have met somebody online, I try my hardest to meet them in person. Right. And I do that by, you know, if I'm heading to Chicago on business, I'm going to look, who do I know in Chicago? I've never met them in person. I'm going to try and add one or two people to my day, you know, yeah. and make that connection. And it's hard to do. It is a lifestyle. It is, I'm not telling anybody it's easy, but when people look at, you know, where, what I've accomplished in the last 10 years and say, well, how did you get that kind of success so fast? That's how I did it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's not like it, totally easy. I think it is obvious. Yeah. <laughs> it is simple, <laughs> but it's yeah. not, you know, always easy. So those are those anchors and how I think they help you really begin to have deeper connections with the people around you. And I believe in that right. micro influence. I, I believe in really quality to a small group. And that's how you go out and influence large because those people will begin to advocate for you strongly. You and I've yeah. mentioned Sarah Kotba, that gets to be the third recommendation in the <laughs> podcast, but we're very close and we understand each other's, you know, issues and problems. And then those people start advocating for you it, when you are not in that room. And that's what influence is really about. And when yeah. you think about collaboration, you need to have influence with a lot of people so that you can get involved in better collaborations. Yeah. And I love how you talk about those multiple touch points, uh, which gives you an opportunity to be interesting to them, but also you an opportunity to show that you're interested. And ultimately, then you earn the right to ask for what you want or what you need. Right. That's right. That's right. And you can't forget that part. Some right. people just, so just constantly right. <laughs> yeah, they connect, 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 and never ask for the business. And that is a loss because we are here for business. And it's, if, if you have paid it forward to someone, there's no reason you can't say, you know, we've really worked together on a lot of things, or we've done this together, or you've known me. Is there anything that would keep you from working with me? Yeah. That's not salesy. That's not weird. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, you get it and, you want, and it's also, work. it's information yeah. you want to know. You're, you know, yeah. you're a qualitative researcher. You want to know this stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Definitely. I could talk about this book all day, um, but I, I want to make a short announcement and then ask a very specific question about it. If that's okay. Go for uh, it. 
So, so here's the good news. So Priscilla is going to be at IIEX next week in Austin. Uh, and she's doing a live podcast there, which is really cool. And it's got a great guest. Do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I have Henry Bremhorst joining me. He's the senior global enterprise solutions director for Meltwater. And he and I are going to talk about what brands need to have greater influence on the consumer today. So they are an influence company and um, there's just a really good connect with us because they they bring more people to help brands grow. So we're going to do that on my digital transformation success podcast live from IIEX. It'll be great. Cool. And I also will be podcasting live from IIEX on Thursday. My guest will be Nicholas Gianti, who's a UX researcher and film producer uh, who works for IBM's Red Hat. So very exciting. So definitely come out and see Priscilla and uh, me. But here's a question I want to ask, because you talk a bit in the book about uh, exactly what you said. It's like people uh, reach out and they do all these things and they forget to ask, right? In a similar way, they go to conferences, they talk to people and are like, oh, that was a great conference. And then they've got nothing to show for it because they haven't really uh, followed up, followed through, all those kinds of things. So what advice would you have for people who are going to IIEX next week uh, to make yeah. that in? Well, a lot of people say to me, well, I just don't know who's coming. Really? Have you not looked at that website? Because I can tell you who's coming. All of the sponsors are coming. All of the speakers are coming. So you already have a very long list of people that you can connect with that you know are going to be there. Now, I understand that you usually don't get the attendee list unless you sponsor something, um, but maybe collaborate with someone who is. <laughs> There's an idea for you <laughs> and get the list ahead of time. But yeah, for me, it really is about what you said at the very beginning of this conversation is that collaboration and big wins do not happen without intention. So please quit wasting your money and going to events and having no plan. And for me, the bare minimum is three weeks up the event and three weeks down. So I want to know what are you doing? One solid larger outreach and then a couple smaller social things um, and, you know, break it up. I look at that and say, I, that's probably 15 touches and I have a rule of 15. And that is that right. if you are going to touch someone 15 times, then 10 of them need to be just wildly interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Just be interesting. <laughs> um, the cardinal rule of the, of the web and business today is don't be boring, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, four of those need to be overtly helpful. And what I mean by that is you show that you're interested. So if we're going to IIEX, where there are people looking for innovation and ways to apply you know, AI or other platforms or new technology or new methodologies, you know, then provide something that is helpful, prescriptive, overtly helpful. Like you're like, no, I thought of you and this is what I created, right? So the platinum rule, right? Yeah. And then the last one is that should earn you the right to ask for one meeting. Yep. So don't forget to ask for it, but hey, I was hoping we could follow up. Would you be willing to get on a call for 15 minutes I'll explain my thing for five. You explain your things for five and we'll figure out how, if we should go forward. Mm -hmm. Very low risk, but a way of really making sense of the investment of your time, your energy and the money to go to these events. And I love face-to-face -face, and I think it's important to be there. I just think a lot of people waste their time and money and I wish more, it would even make the event more dynamic if more people came with this intention. Yes, yes. Here, here. I totally agree, Priscilla. Uh, I thank you so much for putting your thoughts and words down in this book because I found it immensely helpful and I will continue to find it immensely helpful. Here it is, collaboration. I, I love how yours looks a little war, uh, worn and torn and that makes me really happy, Matt. That's, <laughs> that's when you know I like a book, right? So Yeah, and a bigger uh, collaboration, Melina Palmer, who also has a podcast in our same vein, um, when she interviewed me, hers was all damaged and note taken. And I was like, you know, <laughs> that's just... That's such a huge compliment. And I, I really thank you for your time and just being willing to, you know, let me come on again and, you know, and work with your audience because it is something I believe in. I do think that that's how we've been able to create a really strong professional relationship. And I think that's what's going to help our industry go forward. Yeah, very good. Here, here. I appreciate that, Priscilla. I just have to think about, am I going to be interesting, interested, or ask you what I want? when I see you in at IIEX, so. <laughs> you, you've earned the right for it all, so go for it.
Last question, because somebody asked me this, I was on a podcast for my band, actually, okay. uh, just this past week. So they asked me, uh, any artist alive or dead, if you could choose to see them this weekend, let's say, who would that be? Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel. Yes. Excellent choice. I like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Such a thinker. Cool. A beautiful person. <laughs> Absolutely. So deep. It's lovely. <laughs> Very deep. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, musically deep as well, not just lyrically. So good stuff. Excellent. All right, Peter Gabriel, that's the answer. Uh, but uh, hey, let's see you at IEX uh, next week, Priscilla. Really looking forward to your session. We'll talk soon. Bye. Oh, love it.